Um, so I don't think we need to give much of an introduction to what is SIGSTOR here. Um, but I think this talk is really you know, principled around the idea that maybe SIGSTOR is new to you. So for those of you in the room who are probably already you know, familiar or invested in SIGSTOR, um, this you know, is prob was probably your journey at some point, but I think we're targeting um, you know, folks who are look interested in, in learning what SIGSTOR is and, and how things actually work. And that was really the, you know, the, the kind of premise of what led me to you know, talk to Zach about you know, building out this talk. Um, so generally, when you ask what is SIGSTOR, um, somebody gives you something like this, right? Like this is a high-level diagram. Um, it, it, it's throwing around a lot of jargon. Um, and you know, for the most part, it's not the most helpful resource to actually grok exactly what's happening when you sign something with SIGSTOR. Um, so our goal is to basically dive into each of these components and you know, break down each step so that we can really kind of go under the hood as to what happens when you sign something with SIGSTOR. So this is really kind of like prefaced by my personal experience when you know, early on in my IT career, um, I you know, was learning networking and I you know, kind of read about the you know, seven layer burrito or the OSI stack or whatever, and you know, tried to really grok what was going on by looking at layers and things like that. But really, at the end of the day, like, you know, I didn't truly understand what was happening until this magical moment when I popped open TCP dump and you know, started capturing packets. And, and you know, with my hands on something real, um, I could actually understand what was going on in networking, right? Like, I felt like I was, you know, that was my kind of uh, neo kung fu moment when I uh, truly understood something. Um, and that's, that's really like the idea here, right? Is like we'd like to actually give you something that you can touch and um, interface with directly as opposed to just kind of talking about higher level concepts and kind of maybe remove some of the abstractions that SIGSTOR makes um, you know, for developers to make the tool easy um, and actually kind of dive into how things work under the hood. So the way that we did this is we basically, um, you know, Zach added a, a few lines of code um, and you know, created a uh, basically a, a fork of, of cosine that instead of actually having these things just exist in, in memory uh, when you run, you know, a, a cosine signature, uh, to actually dump them out to disk, right? So, like, we actually have these artifacts around. We can inspect them. We can truly understand everything that's going on um, just because they're, you know, locally there in the file system. Um, and we made this uh, available as well. And there'll be a, a blog post that will kind of walk you through this if you want to recreate this yourself. So this is you know, basically you know, what we did. And, and in this case, we actually just signed this, this blob of you know, hello SIGSTORCON. Um, and you know, fortunately, we don't need this uh, cosine experimental flag anymore um, due to the co cosine being GA, which is great. But you know, again, the, the key uh, piece here is that you know, when you run through these steps that are, that are recreatable is that you'll end up with these artifacts on disk. And we can actually kind of walk through each of these artifacts and, and find out what's going on during the signature operation. So first off, like, let's kind of lay out what we're talking about. So we're talking about like keyless signing. Um, obviously, SIGSTOR, you know, provides multiple ways to sign, but you know, the, the, key, the keyless signing is, um, you know, probably the most interesting, particularly from a, a human perspective, right? Like, if you're, like, a machine, like, you're probably um, not going to be using this. But as, as a human, like, there's a lot of uh, just intrinsic benefits to this, right? First off is, like, we're going to start here with OIDC and, like, what we call the OIDC dance. Um, and a little bit of, like, a plug here is, like, the whole concept of what we're trying to do is we're actually trying to uh, assign you know, your identity to the artifacts that you produce, right? And in the old world of like, you know, using things like, you know, GPG, et cetera, like that identity is basically just a blob of, you know, uh, of crypto like on a, on a file system, right? And that's not the best way to assert your identity. Like in most environments like, you know, SSO um, and OIDC is, is kind of the, the way that actually helps you, um, you know, assign what that identity is. Um, so, there's, there's a lot of kind of benefits into, into OIDC, right? Like, um, if someone leaves, like, you can, you know, revoke their, uh, their access. Um, you don't have to worry about a key leaking. Um, there, there's a bunch of, you know, baked-in benefits here. But in essence, what we're going to describe is kind of how this OpenID Connect flow works. Um, so first off, when I sign something, um, you know, we're going to be interfacing with public or the public GA, um, you know, Folsio instance, our certificate authority, 
um, in SingStore. And just like any other certificate authority, like we basically need to convince that authority to kind of you know, give me a certificate that says this email or this identity is the thing that's actually signing um, you know, the, the artifact, in this case, just the blog. So we're gonna walk through the authentication piece, like how do I actually prove that I control my identity? And as I've been kind of discussing like OIDC is kind of prime for this, right? Like as opposed to um, keys with OIDC, you can enforce things like, you know, uh, non-fishable two-factor or strong-factor authentication. Um, you can set up policies around it. You can, you know, trust certain um, identity providers, things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, that OIDC is just going to come back with, you know, a jot um, that, you know, is, is basically going to help us take that identity and, and actually do something with it. So when we get back that OIDC token, what we get back is basically a you know base64 encoded um, you know JSON document um, and that includes a, a, he a header, a payload, and a signature. We'll kind of walk through these. So you know we've talked to the identity provider, we've you know done the sign in with Google Flow, uh, we've convinced them that you know we actually own our identity. And when we get that job back, when we look at the header, um, there's a couple things going on, right? And th the question that we're asking ourselves here is like, you know, how should the verifier, which in this case is Fulcio, the certificate authority, um, actually check the job that actually gets assigned to us or token? Um, so if we take a look at the header, we can see that, first off, it needs to know that the algorithm to verify this is, you know, RSA 256. Um, there's also a key ID, which is helpful for us to kind of locate which public key we're actually going to be verifying against. Uh, this is in case like, you know, Google or whatever my identity provider is decides to actually rotate those keys. And then we get into the payload, right? And this is definitely the int most interesting piece, right? So inside of this jot, we have uh, a number of interesting attributes. Like the first one here is this issuer attribute. And this basically tells us that, um, you know, the issuer is OAuth 2.64.dev, um, but in this case, it's actually referring to, uh, to DEX, right? I just mentioned that you're using the Google kind of sign-in flow as, as one example, um, but we actually use DEX um, for reasons. Um, and, you know, we can discuss those if you're interested. Uh, definitely feel free to ask questions. But um, beyond that, we have a, a couple of really interesting attributes about JOTS. Um, one is this audience component, and this defines that, you know, the audience is SigStore. So when we, when we give you this JOT, that means that you can't reuse this to log back into Google or take your Google credential and go authenticate to any old service, right? Like the idea is that we, we scope that audience down to only be valid for SigStore, which is an important security attribute. Um, there, there do be dragons here, right? Like there's some components with uh, certain you know, uh, implementations of Jot that um, you know, might not uh, parse this correctly. Um, but there are additional protections here, right? Um, one is that we have this expiration date. And if we actually kind of zoom into this, we can see that this Jot is only valid for one minute. So the risk of this leaking and you know, causing a, a very bad day is, is you know, diminished by that, that short time uh, of validity. And then, of course, we actually have the identity, um, which is, you know, in this case, it's Zach's email. Um, so, you know, feel free to, to send Zach an email here. Um, sorry for the slight docs there, Zach. And uh, finally, we have this um, connector ID. And, and the reason that we have this is because, you know, we, we kind of talked about how, or federated claims and then, you know, connector ID, um, because we use DEX, right? And, like, the, the reason behind that is, like, you know, we kind of need to like smooth out, you know, different implementations for different, uh, different identity providers. Um, and in this case, you can kind of see that like the federated claim actually does, you know, come from uh, accounts.google.com in this case, right? So like we know that this person uh, who claims to be or who actually was proven to be uh, Zach at ChainGuard um, went through Google to actually sign and, and get that, uh, that piece of identity from this job. And then finally, um, you know, if you look at the, the final bit, uh, we have a redacted signature. Um, and the reason that it's redacted is, you know, um, not because we like to wear tinfoil hats, but because, as we mentioned, like, there are some implementations that, um, you know, don't do uh, a perfect job of kind of verifying those, um, you know, those values, and, and we just didn't really want it to leak. So 
Cool. So, so far we've talked to the OIDC provider. We validated who we are. So we, you know, Google has told us that, you know, uh, this is Zach. Um, we got back a jot and that jot, you know, was basically scoped down so that we could only do SIG store things with it. Um, next, what we're going to do is we're actually going to generate a certificate request, right? So you've probably done this um, at some point um, where you basically have a, you know, signature request to a certificate authority. If you've ever registered a domain and got a certificate for it, it's very similar. Uh, but we'll actually kind of break this down. So in the certificate request, we have a, a freshly generated public key, right? So we generate a public private key um, and we, you know, publish that public key um, in the certificate request. Um, we also have a signed email address. So we have a signature over the email from the OIDC token. And the way that we um, basically do this is we take that private key that we have and then we sign that um, you know, email address and that kind of proves that we're the true owner of this public key. Um, and then finally, you know, there's kind of a reference here to, you know, we, we see this CSR kind of being null. Um, this is because, you know, we, uh, Sixtor doesn't use the standard kind of PKCS number 10. Sorry for throwing um, those, you know, bits of jargon at you if you're not familiar, but that's just kind of the standard uh, certificate signing request that um, is typical in a lot of these implementations. Cool. All right. And then now you've sent your certificate request. Hopefully when you request a certificate, you get a certificate, and that's what we're going to see next. Um, we're, we're skipping over the CT log for the sake of time, but happy to talk to anyone afterwards. Um, so this is a long document, um, and what, what we're doing is we're printing it out using a tool called STEP, which is a very handy way to look at um, a certificate. Uh, and so we're just going to run through the highlights. So uh, very similar in many ways to the job that we saw before. The issuer here is SIGStore.dev, and we're actually coming through a SIGStore intermediate node in, in the middle. Um, like the JOT, if you look at the validity, uh, it's only valid for a very short period of time. This is one of the key security guarantees we give you with SIGStore, is that the risk of a private key actually leaking is, is mitigated because uh, the certificates that we're issuing are only around for, for 10 minutes. So after 10 minutes, uh, such a key is going to be uh, pretty useless. Um, and then there's, there's usual stuff that's in every certificate, the public key and so on. Um, if we go to the next page, uh, you, can see, you can see some fun stuff. So there's my email again. So SIGSTOR basically took my email from the JOT and it stuck it in as the subject alternative name, uh, which is sort of, uh, for convoluted reasons, the way you specify the name of the party uh, that has been granted the certificate. Uh, we also have uh, all these fun numbers right below it. Those are an X509 extension registered to the SIGSTOR project that indicates what the identity provider used as the source of the identity that wound, it, that wound up in the SAN is. So in, in, when you're going to verify this, very typically you want to know who's signing, but also who says that that person controls this, this public key. So zjn at chaingar.dev as, as attested to by accounts.google.com, much, much more convincing than zjn at chaingar.dev as attested to by Neopets. Um, the, uh, so the next thing we're going we're gonna to highlight is the SCT. This stands for a signed certificate timestamp. Again, we're going to gloss over many of the details of certificate transparency here, but this is basically a receipt from the certificate transparency log that says, uh, uh, I, the certificate transparency log, have seen this corresponding cert, uh, and it's gotten a company in signature. Um, and then finally, uh, at the very end of the certificate, you're going to see a signature. And this is actually a signature from that Folsio intermediate node. Uh, so you can take this certificate, um, and there's going to be a certificate chain that gets you all the way back up to the Folsio root key. Uh, which you, the verifier, will have gotten through TUF. Uh, we saw a great talk earlier today that went through many of those details, uh, which is great because I didn't put them in, in this deck. Um, but yeah, and so, and so this basically, uh, with this certificate, you can sort of trace all the way back up to Folsio and know that the identity mentioned in the certificate, as long as you trust Folsio, that uh, any signature that validates against the certificate is legit for that identity. Um, great, so now we have our... Uh, a certificate, uh, let's go ahead and sign something. And uh, typically what you're doing in SIGSTOR, uh, you're not 
just signing uh, the, the naked bytes of the image or the, uh, in our case, the data.txt file. Uh, you sort of have to format that in a little bit of an envelope, and that's, that's going in the API, uh, something that's referred to as a proposed entry. Um, so uh, there are a bunch of different types. Here we're looking at the default type uh, for assigning an uh, artifact in, in Cosign, uh, which is called a hashed record. Um, so a lot of base64 nonsense that I don't expect you to be able to read, but I, I'm uh, illustrating for you what, what these things are. Uh, so this envelope is going to mention the hash of our artifact. So if you see that, that uh, value right there at the top, um, if you run SHA-256-SUM on that data.txt file we created earlier that said hello SIGSTORCON, uh, that's what you're gonna get. Uh, finally, you're gonna get a signature over that um, data, the data in the hash, uh, that validates against the public key that we just generated and that goes in our X509 certificate. Uh, so remember the X509 cert uh, had, a, had a, you know, public key in there. Uh, that's that, if you take that public key, you can use that to validate this signature over that data. Uh, and then finally, we actually stick that entire certificate in here uh, under the slightly misleadingly named public key.content field. Uh, this is actually a base64 encoded version of that certificate that we just saw. So then uh, Recore is gonna take that proposed entry, it's going to make sure that the signature checks out, and then it's going to return to you something called a signed entry timestamp. Uh, and so this, this is, uh, we stored it in log entry.json. Uh, this is relatively a uh, simple document. The complicated part is in verification, which we'll see on the next slide. Uh, but for now, uh, the body is the most interesting thing. That's actually a base64 encoded version of the file that you just saw on the last slide. Um, the astute observer might note that there are like triple or quadruple base64 encoded things in there by this point. Uh, that's, you know, that's just how life goes sometimes. Um, there's also an integrated time. So remember we, we made a big deal earlier about how the public key was only gonna be valid for 10 minutes. Uh, does that mean you can no longer uh, validate an artifact after 10 minutes? Uh, that would be very, very annoying and uh, make this a pretty useless system. So no, you actually can validate things after, after 10 minutes after the certificate has expired. What you do is you check that the signature was made during the lifetime of the certificate. Uh, and so that's this integrated time here. Uh, right now, Recore is typically the source of this time. There's some, some fun ongoing work to allow you to plug in a timestamp authority following a protocol like RFC 3161 or rough time and use that uh, instead or in addition. Um, yeah, and then finally, we're gonna look at this verification stuff. Uh, this is information that you can use to cryptographically check that that log entry that we, we submitted actually wound up inside of ReCore. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, don't have time to, to go into uh, what a Merkle tree is, how a transparency log works, but this is sufficient, basically, cryptographic information that you can check, okay, all this stuff wound up inside of ReCore. And then finally, we have the signed entry timestamp, which uh, for, the, for the lazy or for the offline, if you don't uh, wanna go uh, and do that check all the way back up to ReCore, you can just uh, take ReCore's word for it. So if you have ReCore's public key, you can, this signed entry timestamp will be a signature over a bunch of the rest of the data in this log entry.json. And so that should be enough to convince you again that this other stuff, the body uh, and the uh, timestamp are, are legitimate. Um, yeah, so uh, now you've seen everything. Step four is just publishing, which is going to vary a lot based on your use case, uh, but could look as simple as like FTP. Um, you know, it's, it's just about getting uh, sort of the data, that certificate, that signed entry timestamp, and then the signature over the data. Um, getting all of that to the end user who's gonna verify it. And there's some, some ongoing work to uh, turn those four things into one thing we're gonna call a bundle. Uh, shout out to, to Frederick, who's, who's been working really hard on a, on a specification for that. And for the Kubernetes folks in the room, like I think it's worth calling out that typically the, the location that we store these values is in an OCI registry. So you don't mm -hmm. have to think too hard about where you actually store this um, because it sits alongside the container image if you're using containers in Kubernetes. Um, which, you know, makes it that whole, you know, experience like just super easy and plug in. Yeah, yeah, and so for those who don't have the luxury, if you're uh, working on an integration with a package manager, 
um, mm. I see a couple of folks in the room who are doing that right now, uh, you're going to have to unfortunately take care of this step for yourself. But all that is is pushing bits around. There's no fancy cryptography. The fancy cryptography happens before uh, and at the end where, where folks are verifying. Um, speaking of, uh, this is kind of the reverse of that process. Uh, this is what a verifier has to check. And it seems kind of complicated, right? Six steps is a large number of steps. Uh, but, you, but you'll actually see these correspond pretty closely to the steps we took when creating all of this. So you're going to check that the signature is from who you um, think it's from. The way you do that is by looking at the certificate. Check the subject and the issuer of the certificate. So if you trust uh, universally artifacts from me, which maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't, um, <laughs> but, but you, you can sort of check for a, a subject alt name that says vj and at chainguard.dev and an issuer accounts.google.com. Uh, you're going to check that that certificate is valid, that it validates against Folsio's public key. That Folsio public key, again, you'll have gotten via Tuff. Uh, so refer back to the, to the Tuff talk earlier in the day. Um, you're going to check that the signature on the log entry, so that's where you get that timestamp from, is valid for the, um, sorry, the signature in the log entry, so that's the signature on the actual data itself, is valid for the public key in the certificate. Uh, you're going to check that the log entry timestamp is signed by Recore. You're going to check that the timestamp was during the window in which the certificate was valid. And finally, this is actually really important and really easy thing to forget to do. You're going to check that the data that was signed is actually the data that you care about. So it, it doesn't do me any good to, to check all of these things and then to not say, oh, by the way, you know, uh, I, I validated this over here, and I'm going to use this totally unvalidated blob and run that. You got to actually match up the thing you're running or the thing you're downloading to the to the log entry. Um, yeah. So at this point, uh, hopefully, this has uh, demystified, and I use that word very deliberately, uh, a little bit about how SIG store and cosine work. Um, uh, it's not magic, right? All of that's just bits and bytes. Uh, and uh, I see, see Bob in the audience here. Um, I, would, I would encourage you, if you want to learn more, uh, there's going to be a blog post version of this, which is cool. If you want to go even deeper, uh, there is a link, which I know you cannot click. But if you just Google it, uh, it'll, it'll pop up. Uh, SigStore the Bash way, which basically takes you through this very like bits and bytes approach to how SigStore actually works. Uh, but totally on the command line, you uh, compose all these JSON documents yourself. Um, and uh, like any good cryptography security prog uh, project, if you screw up, it just fails, and it doesn't tell you why it failed. <laughs> um, but but it's a really instructive exercise, I think, to go to through it's sort of the next level of of take it apart to understand how it works. Um, yeah, and we hand waved over a bunch today. Uh, happy to take questions offline about uh, sort of DEX and uh, why there's a transparency log and how that works and and so on. Um, but hopefully this this sort of took you from having this abstract understanding of how this all, all works, it's a complicated system, to sort of understanding a little bit, oh yeah, okay, that's, that's how the data flows through the system, that's where this entry comes from, that's what this means. Um, yeah. Anything else you wanna add? No, no. That's... Cool, all right, thanks everybody. Thank you. Cool, uh, how, how are we doing on time? Do we have time for a question or two? Uh, awesome. Okay, does anyone have questions? Yeah. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I uh, will hopefully be able to get that back. Yes, yes, yes. Give it a second. So the 10 minute window is here in uh, the validity here in the X509 cert. Oh, sorry? Oh, the, um, yeah, this, this one? Yeah. yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So the 10 minute window is going to start when Folsio creates that X509 cert, um, and it's going to go for the next 10 minutes. So you better um, get uh, that proposed entry in the next step to recore within those 10 minutes. Otherwise, uh, that timestamp is going to be outside of that window. Uh, fortunately, the typical time that this takes is like a couple of seconds, so, so 10 minutes is a pretty big grace period. Yeah. Sorry, I can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so the 10 minutes is a somewhat arbitrary number. Uh, it, it, it should be pointed out. Uh, we chose it as sort of like very, very worst case scenario. Uh, this is all going to happen, even if ReCore. Right now, ReCore is actually quite speedy um, due to uh, a bunch of things, including the, the sharding work, uh, which, has, which has sort of sped things up quite a bit. Um, and so we're not worried about that, but in, a, in a, the long, long term, we might worry about, okay, maybe ReCore is eventually consistent. It takes a while for things to get integrated. Um, so we want that timestamp to happen. You know, we, we, we think 10 minutes is kind of a good uh, middle ground between, you know, ah, it doesn't feel like very long at all. It feels like very unlikely that your key would leak and an attacker would get it and be able to sign stuff during that window, uh, but, uh, but uh, still long enough that you're gonna be able to do what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a really, really good question. Uh, the the sorry. Oh yeah, great. That's a really good question, which I'm going to repeat right now. Uh, the question was, uh, when you're verifying, how do you know what the subject that you're supposed to be checking is, and in particular, how do you know what the issuer is for that subject? Um, so this is. Uh, the, the sort of really unhelpful answer I could give you is that this is out of scope for SigStore. Um, uh, and it's a really un unhelpful answer, and that's, that's sort of not where we want to go in the long term. Uh, but, but basically, SigStore handles the mapping the identity to the artifact leg of things. Uh, we would strongly encourage you to look at something like Tuff uh, for doing the delegation uh, for that for that artifact. So in a closed ecosystem in your own like in an organization that's your own company, you might have one party that's in charge, you know, one service or one individual or one team that's in charge of signing all the artifacts. In that case, you can sort of hard code at the verification site uh, the a verification policy that says every artifact I run must be signed by security team at mycompany.com. Um, I'll, I'll pick on pick on William because I see him in the audience here. Uh, if you're going to do uh, this at the package repository level, then basically the package repository, something like the Python package index, is going to basically need to say for package X, maintainer Y is trusted to sign that. Uh, and the reason I've I've been sort of so pedantic about also always putting the issuer there is that I think you should consider an identity to be a tuple of sort of, you know, an email or a username, comma, the issuer of that identity. So zjn at chainguard.dev uh, as attested to by accounts.google.com. As opposed to, yeah, or Neopets, yeah. If, if that's who you really, really <laughs> want to base, base the root of trust on. Um, that answer the question? Yeah. yeah. It punted a little bit, but I'm happy to discuss with you offline some, some cool uh, tricks. Okay, I think my MacBook is telling me we're, we're done. So thank you very much.